Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Restore live stream. It's great to be with you today. I hope you've had a really good Easter season. I'm aware that uh, most of the kids are still uh, on holidays, so I uh, hope you're enjoying uh, holidays time and space. Um, I'm really excited to be with you today because we're kicking off a brand new se series. So from now until um, the May, uh, end of May, uh, half term, uh, we're going to do a brand new series. And uh, every now and then we like to take a book from the Bible and, uh, and work our way through the whole book, really. Um, partly because uh, this book is an amazing book. It's the story of God's uh, relationship through history with us. And there's lots of amazing stories about the uh, working of God, the character of God, the nature of God. And so to help us uh, maybe get a better understanding of the Bible, hopefully to help us fall more in love with the Bible, uh, we like to take from time to time uh, a book and uh, work our way through it. And uh, for this next season, we're going to work our way through one of the great books of the Old Testament, uh, and that is the book of Exodus. So it's quite a long book, it's 40 chapters if you read it, uh, maybe you want to start reading it over the coming weeks. Maybe you want to uh, look at a film like The Prince of Egypt that's kind of based on the story of Moses, Moses and the, the journey of Israel uh, from slavery in Egypt into freedom. Um, but it also opens up the whole context of the fact that we have a God who wants to set us free. And so we're looking at the book of Exodus, but we're picking up on the whole theme of from slavery to freedom. And uh, we know, obviously, for the nation of Israel, they were in a, a position of physical slavery. Um, but actually, in lots of ways, uh, we can be slaves to our circumstances, our situations, maybe habits and behaviours. And uh, we're going to track through the book of Exodus, and we're going to trust that God is going to speak to us about how he wants to uh, bring us into a greater sense of freedom uh, these days, as well as be the source of bringing other people in the uh, community around us into freedom as well. So our kind of banner as we go through the book of Exodus is from uh, slavery to freedom. Uh, what, the way we're going to do it is we're not going to take uh, the 40 chapters and, uh, and look at them week by week. We're going to pick up on the major events and uh, journey our way through that. So we're going to look at uh, 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 how you uh, deal with adversity, because for each uh, Israel, it starts off with a time of great adversity for them. And how do you handle that in a godly way? We're going to talk about how you encounter God, because Moses has an encounter with God at the burning bush. We're going to talk about uh, uh, battle, uh, because uh, Israel uh, has to take on Pharaoh, uh, and there's a great conflict uh, between those two. Uh, we're then going to look at the journey into freedom as uh, Israel goes through the parting of the Red Sea. Uh, we're going to look at uh, journeying through the wilderness. Uh, what's it like in life when we between two places. We know that God's promised us this, but we're currently living in that. And how do you deal with that wilderness kind of between uh, uh, season experience? And then we're going to look at the Ten Commandments and we're going to look at the framework for how we uh, live well as God's people. So that's kind of some of the topics we're going to be looking at over the coming weeks. My job today really is to give us an introduction and uh, a flavour of the overall uh, story of the book of Exodus. In lots of ways, this is maybe going to be a bit more of a teach because there's lots of profundity about the book of Exodus. I like that word. It sounds really good, doesn't it? Profundity about the book of Exodus. And so we're going to uh, pick up on some of those things. So in some ways, maybe it's going to be a little bit more of a, of a biblical teach as opposed to a preach. But it is me and uh, I'm a preacher, so we'll probably have preaching moments through it. But I just want to uh, give you uh, maybe some uh, keys to understanding Exodus to, as I say, help us fall more in love with the word of God. I, I truly love the word of God and I truly love seeing Jesus through the word of God. And so we're going to look at the book of Exodus, but we're going to point to some of the things that it shows us about the work of Jesus as well. You'll get the idea as we go along. So uh, Exodus is the second book in the Bible. First book in the Bible is the book of Genesis. Uh, the word Genesis means beginning, and so it's the beginnings of God creating the heavens and the earth, God creating mankind. It's the beginnings of God wanting to relate to us. It also contains the beginnings of where things go wrong through the fall and the struggle to try and get back to being God's people living in wonderful relationship and harmony with him. Um, uh, the book of Exodus, uh, the name Exodus uh, means uh, a going out, a leaving or a departure, a bit like the word exit. And uh, it, it, by the end of Genesis, we'll talk about in a moment, uh, 
Israel end up in slavery in a foreign land. And Exodus is the story of a God who rescues them from that and brings them out into a place of freedom. And uh, one of the good things about God is God is a God of hope and is a God who loves us passionately. And so today, if you end up, if you feel like you're in a hard situation, if you feel like you're locked in, if you feel like um, you wonder uh, whether this situation is ever going to end, know that God is for you, that God is with you, and God is a God who wants to rescue you and bring you into a, a, a place of a blessing. Um, I, I, like I said, there's 40 chapters to the book of Exodus. You can really uh, cut it into two pieces. Uh, verse, uh, chapters 1 to 18 is the uh, physical story of how God uh, rescues uh, Israel from their place of uh, slavery. And uh, lots of people say that 1 to 18 is the story of how God takes Israel out of Egypt. And then from 19 through to 40, the second half of the book, is then God giving his instructions how to keep Israel free. And so uh, lots of people say verse, uh, chapters 1 to 18 is how God takes Israel out of Egypt. Uh, chapters 19 to 40 is how God takes Egypt out of Israel. And uh, obviously for us to get free, we uh, need not only to be set physically free from our situations, our environments, our circumstances, but then to live free, we often need something to be reprogrammed, to be rewired in, in our patterns of behavior, uh, what we believe about ourselves, what we speak over our lives, some of the inner things uh, we need setting free from. And we see the same pattern for God's people here in the book of Exodus. Firstly, they brought into physical freedom and then God speaks to them and gives them instructions for how they can stay free so they don't quickly resort back into freedom. Um, I, I'm going to read uh, a little bit from Exodus chapter 1 um, because uh, that uh, is the beginning of the story and it'll uh, uh, enable me then to pick up on some of the themes as we carry on. Exodus chapter 1, if you've got a Bible with you, you can uh, read along with me. I'm going to read from verse 1 through to 14. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to the people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country." So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Python and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and work them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. Um, just in terms of, uh, again, putting Exodus in its context, uh, an interesting thing about the book of Genesis, the previous book, is Genesis starts with the creation of life. It begins, the very first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, but 50 chapters later, at the end of Genesis, it ends in a place of death, which wasn't God's original intention. In fact, uh, the last verse in uh, the book of Genesis is, so Joseph died at the age of 110. After they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. And so Genesis tells us the story, really, of the fall of mankind, how we start off from a, in a good world, uh, uh, living in relationship with God, to how things go incredibly wrong, and God's people end up in exile and in captivity. Captivity, And rather than uh, perpetuating life, they end up in a position of death. The good news, though, is there's still a seed of hope. And Joseph, just before he dies, at the end of uh, a, a Genesis, it says uh, in verses 24 to 25, Genesis 50, Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, 
but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up from this place. And Joseph knew, because of his relationship with God, he knew that even though God's people had ended up in a place of captivity and a place of exile, that God had not given up on them. And even with his last dying breath, he declared to them, God is going to rescue you. And when he does, make sure you take my bones with you, because I don't want to stay in this place of captivity. And like I said, God's heart is always to rescue us. And even when we're in the tightest, most circumstances, God wants to keep reminding us that he is a God of rescue, and he is able to to do the impossible. And you know what we'll find in the Exodus story, uh, when uh, God does intervene and bring Israel into freedom, one of the things they do is they carry the bones of Joseph and they carry him out of Egypt on his journey towards the promised land because God fulfills his promises. And at the start of uh, Exodus, uh, because it's a continuation of the story of Genesis, we see lots of echoes of the book of Genesis replayed at the beginning of Exodus because it's a continuous story. And just as God is at work in our life day by day and uh, continually is active in our lives, then we expect one book of the Bible to build on, on the previous ones when, as we journey through our history and our story with God. And so in Genesis, we find that when God creates the first man and woman, he says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. And uh, as I read in Exodus chapter one, in verse seven, it says, the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly. They increased in numbers. And the words that are used are exactly the same as the words that are used at the beginning of Genesis. Because God's people, even though they're in exile, even though they're in slavery, God is still working to bless and bring fruitfulness in and through them. And actually what we see in the early chapters of Exodus is even when the persecution intensifies, then Israel still grows and becomes more fruitful and multiplies. And one of the things I've learned in life is that God is always at work. And even in some of our toughest situations, if you keep honouring him, you keep focused towards him, do you know he will still build something good in it? In Romans chapter 8, uh, Paul says that uh, God makes all things work together for good for those who love him. And if we keep leaning back into God, he will use any and every circumstance ultimately to bring something good in our lives, to bring some fruit for, that he can use for the furthering of his kingdom. We just need to keep leaning back into it and leaning back into it and leaning back into it. So even though they're in a tough situation, still that promise from the beginning of Genesis is being fulfilled at the beginning of Exodus that God is leading them and making them fruitful and multiplying them. Uh, um, Again, at the start of uh, Genesis, we find in Genesis chapter 3, at the beginning of the fall, uh, there's an introduction of a character uh, that's the serpent, that's a representation of the enemy who wants to rob that fruitfulness from us. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it says, The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. And we see in Genesis 3, the serpent uses his craftiness to undermine God's people. And again, in the book of Exodus, as Israel is becoming more fruitful, there's an introduction of a character who is Pharaoh, who is the ruler in Egypt. And it says of uh, uh, Pharaoh, his first words uh, spoken in verse 8 are, come, we must deal shrewdly with them. And because he's in fear, because Israel had grown stronger and stronger, because God's hand is on them, God's blessing is on them, then uh, he uh, starts to scheme to undermine their prosperity and, uh, and their fruitfulness, just like the serpent was, uh, was doing that in Genesis 3. So again, you see a repeated pattern, and the enemy always wants to steal, kill, and destroy, is what Jesus says uh, in John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy but I've come that you might have life. And in this life, uh, we live in a situation of battle. 
The enemy wants to stop us getting hold of everything God has for us. The enemy wants to stop us being blessed by God. Uh, we shouldn't be uh, surprised by that. Uh, and he works by a, a, often by deception and lies and, and in a very shrewd kind of cunning way. And we see Pharaoh as a representation of the enemy who we will see through the course of Exodus uh, being defeated. Um, the third uh, kind of little analogy to uh, the book of, of Genesis is uh, deliverance obviously comes in uh, the book of Exodus through uh, the, the guy called Moses, uh, one of the famous uh, heroes of the Old Testament. Uh, but the name Moses means to draw out. He's actually called uh, Moses because uh, Pharaoh's daughter, uh, when she sees him uh, drifting in a basket on the Nile, uh, she picks him out of the Nile. And because she picks him out of the Nile, draws him out of the uh, Nile, she calls him Moses. But actually Moses calling from God is to draw God's people out of slavery. Because again, as I say, that's part of the heart of God. Um, what's interesting, though, is in Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, it says, now a man of the tribe of Levi, so a priestly line, uh, married a Levite woman and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. And the context of this is Pharaoh is so frightened by the Israelites, he's trying to put to death all of the uh, male child's the children that are being born. But Moses' mother, when Moses is born, notices there's something significant about him. He's, uh, he's God's answer to bring freedom to his people. And it uses this phrase, when she saw that he was a fine child. And literally, when it says, when she, when, he saw, when she saw that he was a fine child, literally that means when she saw that he was a good child. And the word in Hebrew that's used for good is the same word that God uses in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. When uh, through the story of creation, at the end of each day, God says it was good. And it's the first time that word good has been used since the very beginning of Genesis, because God is breaking in with his goodness to bring a restoration and a completion of goodness, because that is the heart of God for rescue. Um, like I say, Exodus introduces us to the fact that God is a God who loves to bring hope and rescue for us. And it, um, Exodus, uh, one of my favourite quotes about Exodus, is Exodus is not a story of a people who escape, but of a God who rescues. Exodus is not a story of a people who escape, it's a story of a God who rescues. And the picture it gives to us is of God as a wonderful, loving rescuer. And actually, the book of Exodus is referenced more in the Old Testament than any other historical book. And so this whole theme of uh, creation and things being good, enslavement as things uh, go wrong, then liberation and renewal is one of the great themes of the Bible. It's one of the great themes of the Old Testament. And over and over again, you know, if you uh, like music, uh, often a song will have a repeated refrain. So there'll be a piece of melody or there'll be particular words and they'll be repeated at various points through the course of a song. And uh, often they're the memorable bits, often they're the, the kind of hooks. But it's like there's this piece of melody that just keeps replaying and replaying and replaying and replaying. And from Exodus onwards, uh, in uh, various uh, different books of the Bible, there'll be references back to the work that God did through the time of the Exodus. Uh, historically, that was thought to be either the 13th or 15th century uh, BC, before the birth of Jesus. But there'll be uh, reminders and references or a recounting of the story, and it's like a repeated refrain that God is a God who rescues. Whatever our current situation is, know that God is a God who rescues, and that melody plays over and over and over again through the Bible. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 12, there's a great phrase that says, Be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And one of the challenges and one of the reasons that God so dramatically rescues Israel uh, from their place of slavery is because he wants them not to forget the great work that he's done and not to forget who he is. And often when we're in hard situations and, uh, and life is uh, looking difficult, quite often the uh, way that our circumstances kind of overwhelm us 
is often our picture of the bigness and the goodness of God uh, disappears and our faith starts to crumble. And at various points, and again, we'll see this in the book of Exodus, God asks them to set up a memorial or uh, to build an altar so that they can say to their children and remind them, God is a God who rescues. So don't forget, this is a God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And one of the prophecies uh, looking towards Jesus in the uh, Old Testament is in Isaiah chapter 11. And uh, in Isaiah chapter 11, it says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, Jesse, uh, from the roots of uh, Israel. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And a few verses on in verse 11, it says, in that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time, to reclaim the surviving remnant of his people. And again, just struck by the phrase, in that day the Lord will reach out his hand a second time. And so when God sends Jesus, the way the language he uses around it is it's like a second exodus. And just in the way that uh, Israel was uh, uh, originally set free from slavery in uh, Egypt, that Jesus would come and set us free from slavery. And so Exodus actually points us towards the work of Jesus. Another phrase I love about the uh, book of Exodus is it says, to fully understand Jesus, we need to understand Exodus. Because Jesus uh, is, uh, is God reaching out a second time to rescue us, if we're going to understand the fullness of what that rescuing means, actually we can unpack that from Exodus. And so as we journey through the book of Exodus over the coming uh, weeks, we're going to be pointing to the work of Jesus because Jesus fulfills, he completes the work of Exodus. And uh, we can understand more what Jesus has done for us as we journey through the book of Exodus. Just a few ways that, uh, that I can uh, draw that out for you. And when we come into the New Testament and we look at the life of Jesus in the four Gospels, all of them draw back to the Exodus story. So Matthew, which kicks off the New uh, uh, Testament, uh, Exodus starts off with Jesus being born, and then there's a tyrannical leader, Herod, who tries to wipe out all of the young uh, uh, male children in the same way as happened at the birth of Moses. And uh, under that pressure, uh, Mary and Joseph flee to Egypt. And so it's like the Moses story being repeated. And actually in uh, verse 15 of Matthew chapter two, uh, it references a, a, a prophecy from the Old Testament that says, out of Egypt I called my son. When Jesus returns, he returns to Israel out of Egypt. And uh, little bits of the Exodus story are being uh, replayed. Jesus then, uh, as Matthew goes on, the next story in the life of Jesus is Jesus gets baptized. And uh, when he gets baptized, the voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son. But then God's spirit comes and rests on him. And obviously a key moment of entering into freedom in the book of Exodus is when God's people journey through the Red Sea. And uh, we'll see later, but in Exodus 14, when God parts the Red Sea, he parts it through a great wind. And uh, if you've watched these live streams uh, much, you'll know that the word that's used in the Bible for wind is the same as the word that's used for spirit. And so God's spirit blew and the Red Sea parted. When Jesus stands in the water of baptism in the River Jordan, then God's spirit, God's breath, God's wind comes and rests on Jesus and empowers him for a new day. And again, it's the story of Exodus being replayed. Straight after the baptism of Jesus, Jesus then goes into the wilderness and he goes into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. It's a replay of the Exodus story of God's people coming through the Red Sea and then spending 40 years in the wilderness and often being tempted uh, by the devil. So again, there's Exodus uh, echoes playing out in the New Testament. Next thing that Jesus does is he goes up uh, a a mount, and uh, from Matthew 5 to Matthew 7, he gives the Sermon on the Mount. 
And uh, in Exodus, after Israel uh, comes through into the wilderness, uh, Moses goes up a mountain and he receives the Ten Commandments, instructions from God, and then relays it to his people. And again, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is being uh, presented as a new Moses, bringing God's people into a new era, era and a new uh, chapter of what he's doing. Uh, Luke's Gospel extends that a little bit more. In Luke chapter 9, there's the story of the Transfiguration. You may know that. Jesus goes up a mountain with... Uh, uh, Peter, James and John and uh, when he's on the top of the mountain then uh, his uh, clothes start to uh, dazzle and, uh, and the glory of God, a cloud comes from heaven and wraps itself around him and the full glory of Jesus is displayed on earth and uh, in, uh, in Luke's account of it in verse 30 it says two men, Moses and Elijah appeared in glorious splendour talking with Jesus and then it goes on and literally it says they spoke about his exodus, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. And Luke points towards what Jesus does at his uh, death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead as being the entry point to us stepping out of our slavery, to our history, to our past, to our patterns of sin and walking into freedom. And again in John's gospel, in John chapter 1, uh, in verse 14, uh, it says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And literally that phrase is, The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And one of the things we will find out in the book of Exodus is that God wants to live with his people and he gives them the instructions to build a tent in which God can dwell in the middle of his people. And that tent is called a tabernacle. And uh, when John writes about Jesus coming and uh, standing with us, he uh, uses exactly the same language that Jesus is God's presence coming and living in the midst of us. In John chapter 1 verse 29, when John the Baptist first sees Jesus, uh, he's quoted as saying, see the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And one of the pivotal stories in the book of Exodus is the uh, sacrificing of the Passover lamb in Exodus 14. That's the beginning of the pathway to freedom through the Red Sea. And when John the Baptist sees Jesus, he sees that Jesus is the forever Passover lamb. You know, Israel every year used to have to sacrifice a uh, Passover lamb and, uh, and thank God for his freedom and put the uh, blood on the doorposts of their home to pray God's protection over their life. Uh, but John the Baptist sees that Jesus is our ultimate Passover lamb who sets us free from our history and brings God's pleasant presence close to us. Paul, when he writes in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7, says, for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Again, in Galatians, uh, Paul writes about the fact that because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. In other words, we're brought back into God's family through Jesus. And then he goes on and says, so you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And I started off at the very beginning and said that so often in life we uh, end up being slaves to something. Uh, addiction is on uh, uh, the rise uh, in the UK and sometimes when we think about addiction we think about uh, drugs and drink and kind of just uh, think of it, it, it like that but actually uh, our contemporary addictions are way way more than that you know sometimes we're uh, addicted to soap operas social media uh, chocolate uh, comfort eating a whole load of different things as well as often patterns of behavior know that Jesus came to bring freedom and to break the power of those things. You are no longer a slave, but God's child. Exodus shows us we have a God committed to bringing freedom. At the very end of the uh, Bible, gone from Genesis right the way through to Revelation, in Revelation chapter 15 gives us a picture of uh, heaven and it gives us a picture of uh, the angels around the throne of God but also God's people around the throne of God. And it says in uh, verse uh, 2, they held harps given them by God and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. And again, a song of praise uh, uh, that, uh, is connect that connects the work of Moses with the work of Jesus. And it goes on and says, Great and marvellous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. And the end point is, uh, 
uh, we are going to be in heaven, caught up with God, and we're going to be praising him and honoring him. But as we honor Jesus, we're going to be able to track uh, what we see in the book of Exodus and see in the life of Moses as, as a foreshadowing of everything that Jesus has done for us. I'm going to bring this into land in a moment. Hopefully this has been helpful in terms of laying some of the uh, framework uh, for us. But I just want to track back to something I said earlier. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 12 says this, says, Be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And something that's really interesting when you begin the work, the, uh, reading the book of Exodus is you find in the first couple of chapters, every reference that's used to God in the book of Exodus, the word that's used for God is the word Elohim, which means the supreme or the mighty one. And then God reveals himself to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. And Moses has this conversation with God. And in the middle of the conversation, Moses says to God, what is your name? And God responds and he gives to Moses his name, which is the name Yahweh, which means I am who I am. In other words, I'm the God who is and I'm the God who's at work. What I love about the name Yahweh is it's a verb, it's not a noun, so it's not a title, it's a reality of an interaction with a God who's continually at work. Um, but it's a fuller revelation, it's a fuller understanding of, uh, of who God is. It's a great understanding. So Elohim, which is, is quite a vague understanding, God brings Moses to a fresh encounter and a fresh understanding of the fullness of God. But what's interesting about the name Yahweh is that Israel actually knew that name before the times of Moses. In fact, in the book of Genesis, 162 times the name Yahweh is used for God. But something happened through Israel's years in suffering that they lost their understanding of the greatness of who God is. And so somehow in their struggles, their trials, their tribulations, their ending up in slavery, they lost sight of Yahweh and they reduced it to being Elohim. And it was a fresh encounter with God that Moses had at a burning bush that restored his understanding that God is Yahweh. And my prayer as we enter into this book of Exodus is that this season will be a season where we encounter God afresh. And in that fresh encounter, we see the glory and the bigness and the greatness of God. And I really had a sense this morning that there's some folk watching and actually the last few years have been tricky years and they've been tough. And uh, out of the last few years, uh, the enemy has robbed you of some of your uh, understanding, expectation, heart knowledge of the bigness of who God is. And I want to come back to Exodus is not a story of a people who escape, but of a God who rescues. And I believe, and I'm going to pray in a moment, that as we journey through the book of Exodus, the reality of a God who has reached out his hand a second time in Jesus is a God who today in this season is able to reach out his hand and rescue us and restore to us uh, our full understanding of his bigness and his greatness and his glory so we can truly truly worship him a bit like the disciples when they went up that mount of transfiguration they saw they saw the fullness of who jesus was and it helped them understand and moses response when he has this encounter with god is he takes off his shoes and he submits to god and he says this is holy ground let's pray lord god i thank you that these uh, stories are written in the bible because they Help us to remember who you are and your great power and your love for us and how you want to work in our lives. And Lord, I thank you that you are a God who rescues.
And I thank you, the book of Exodus is the story of a God who rescues. And Lord, uh, Israel had ended up in captivity because of their own folly. And yet, you didn't reject them. You didn't leave them there. You heard their cries and you rescued them. And Lord, sometimes we end up in places of devastation or slavery because of our own folly, and yet in your love, by your grace, you rescue. And thank you, Jesus came as our ultimate picture of that. And Lord, I want to pray for anyone and everyone watching today. And I pray that today and over these coming weeks, as we journey through the book of Exodus, I pray that we will have a fresh encounter with you, and we will see and experience the greatness of who you are. And just like for Israel, you opened a way through the Red Sea and they came to a whole new land. Lord, I pray in this season together, we might journey out of the old. We might journey out of our slavery. We may journey out of our old mindsets, our patterns of addiction. We might journey out of them and step into a new day of freedom and a promised land of life in all its fullness. So I pray your blessing over every person listening to this today. Pray your blessing over Restore in this season. Lord, thank you that you're a wonderful, wonderful God who rescues. In your wonderful name. Amen. Thank you for joining with us. I hope that's been encouraging and a helpful uh, understanding. I believe Dustin's going to be here next week to take us on in our journey through Exodus. Have a great week. God bless you.